Welcome, everybody, to the Phoenix Seventh-day Baptist Church. Um, I'm really happy to see everyone here. Um, my name's Jessica, for those who don't know, and um, we have a very special uh, presentation today. So um, with Mother's Day being tomorrow, um, artists came up with a really awesome idea to have um, some of us ladies present on women from the Bible and uh, how they emulate um, a, a good woman. And um, a little bit about what we're what we're aiming to do today is, um, you know, we want to speak to the ladies out there, ladies to ladies, and um, not just the women in here, but maybe also the women who are on our uh, broadcast watching us, uh, either in a recording or otherwise. And so um, just want to make it Something special for all of us women, women to women, sharing uh, stories about women and some of their characteristics and how they play the part in um, our virtuous woman here that we'll be talking about a little bit in Proverbs. You'll also notice, too, that we have a number of hymns. Um, our testimonies will be very short. We're shorter. And um, we've hand-selected some songs that we hope you want to follow along with Uh that also reinforce um, the role of a mother and uh, how they impact our the, ch the lives of their children. Afterwards, we're going to have a lunch. So, of course, everybody who's here today, uh, I hope that you will come fellowship with us. And with that being said, uh, we'll have a quick opening prayer, and then uh, we'll start with the first hymn, She Will Be Called Blessed we bow our heads. Father in heaven, thank you for our beautiful Sabbath day and for all the folks who are here today. Thank you for all the women out there um, online watching our presentation today. And uh, thank you for all the men who support us in our endeavors and our, who are our spiritual leaders. Um, we ask that you please be with us as we present and um, make sure that we make the message clear and it's of something you would want us to, to share with others. Thank you for the allergies, I think, um, as well. Uh, you know, uh, I'm sure there's a reason that they're here. And uh, for whatever reason that is, um, we bless you in uh, our troubles and in our, um, our good times. So I pray in your son's name. Amen. Amen. So this is the part of the service where we uh, read the scripture in prayer, and Leland, hope you feel better. I know you were scheduled to do this, um, but we're thinking about you out there. So the verse today, and I'll give you guys some time to flip over to it, is uh, going to be in Proverbs, and it's a few verses, but we're going to turn over to Proverbs 31, and we're going to start in verse 10. And then I'll be reading from 10 to 31, and this is from the uh, New American Standard Bible. So the grammar is a little strange. It's a study Bible, uh, but please bear with me as we go through it. And what this uh, passage is titled is a description of a worthy woman. Starting in verse 10. An excellent wife who can find, for her worth is far above jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. She looks for wool and flax and works with her hands in delight. She is like merchant ships. She brings her food from afar. She rises also while it is still night and gives food to her household and portions to her maidens. She considers a field and buys it. From her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She senses that her gain is good. Her lamp does not go out at night. She stretches out her hands to the distaff, and her hands grasp the spindle. She extends her hands to the poor, and she stretches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household is clothed with, clothed with scarlet. She makes coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. 
Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies belts to the tradesmen. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she smiles at the future. She opens her mouth in wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and bless her, her husband also, and he praises her, saying, Many daughters have done nobly, but you excel them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her the product of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. For prayer today, I want to ask if anybody has any requests before we start off our service. Um, obviously, people know my sister had ACL surgery, so I'm going to add her to the list. Um, Dad, I hope your recovery is going well, so you're also on the list. Um, Priscilla, I know of your, your mother, and I hope I'm not front-running anybody's prayer requests here. <laughs> um, but uh, those are the three I can come up with, and Emily out in France, Leland's goddaughter. Uh, who who am I missing and forgetting here? Who else? Leland, that's right. Oh, sorry, Leland. Go ahead, James. Justin, with cancer, right? Uh, let me, I don't know. Okay, John. But you have a friend with cancer. His name is Rich. It's crazy. Uh, someone named Tom. God. Thanks. Go ahead, Ardeth. My oldest son has uh, cancer. They found it in his leg. Oh, no. And they don't really know what to do. May I have his name? Johnny. Johnny. Who else? Victoria, I'm praying for your family's trip. Hope everything is safe over there. And if you have a silent request that's on your heart, um, I'm sure God knows it and hears it. So uh, feel free to put that out there for him to hear. And um, we'll go ahead and bow our heads in prayer. Father in heaven, once again, thank you for this beautiful day and our worship service here in Phoenix. We have a number of folks we'd love to lift up to you and uh, hope that your will is done. Please be with my sister and her ACL surgery, my dad and his recovery, Priscilla's mother and her leg, uh, Emily out in France, who uh, we know means a lot to Leland and is, is one of the women out here that we know is um, a beautiful person who um, influenced Leland's life greatly. Please be with her and her family. Um, on the topic of Leland, please be with Leland and his, uh, he doesn't feel very well today. Whatever that looks like, please help heal him. Uh, we ask for a uh, prayer for Justin and his uh, autoimmune disease, Rich and his cancer, and uh, Tom. Uh, you know who Tom is, Father, and uh, we know we want to see him in your kingdom in the future. Please uh, speak to him in his heart and send your spirit to guide him. Our this oldest son, Johnny, has leg cancer, and it's a little confusing for everyone, doctors, and the impact of the family is um, difficult. Please be with uh, not just Johnny, but his medical providers and uh, Ardeth and her family as well. We, uh, we're missing a few people today. Becky is out with her husband, Steve, um, hopefully having a, a really great time out there. So we pray for their uh, trip. and. Um, Please bring them back to us safely. Father, you also know what's on our hearts and our silent requests. Um, whatever those are, um, however they manifest, uh, please be with those who have those requests and have your will be done. And uh, finally, please be with all the women out there who, um, when we read about the virtuous woman, may not fit those um criteria or qualities, um, just as not all of us will fit those criteria and qualities, please 
uh, help lift us up to be the people that we should be for our children, our spouses, our communities, and our families. I pray in your son's name. Amen. All right. The next song um, is going to be called Now We All Thank God. And uh, Priscilla, remind me, is this a singing song? Yeah. Okay. And this one's a singing song. So this will be the last time I ask you guys to stand. Um, and uh, if you please stand while we um, sing Now Thank We All Our God. Now thank we all our God. Now thank we all our God. Sorry, there's a comma there. I was like, we're God? I don't know. <laughs> but go ahead and stand with us. Thank you. Welcome, SDB family and friends. In the words of an esteemed of mine, I am not a public speaker. Bear with me. So in Judges 4, 18 to 21, we read about Jael. Now you might think this is strange, but here goes. Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, Come, my lord, come right in. Don't be afraid. So he entered her tent, and she covered him with a blanket. I'm thirsty, he said. Please give me some water. So she opened a skin of milk and gave him a drink and covered him up. Stand in the doorway of the tent, he told her. If someone comes by and asks you, is anyone there? Say, no. But Jael, Heber's wife, picked up a tent peg and a hammer, and went quietly to him. While he lay fast asleep, exhausted, she drove the pig through his temple into the ground, and he died. Now, I'm not suggesting we should go out and do those kind of things to people. But to me, this is a kind of picture of us. We use the word of God as a double-edged sword to pierce the minds and hearts of people for salvation and bring them to Jesus. How many of us miss an opportunity to say something to somebody? The word of God is our tent peg to plant the seed in the hearts and minds. Deborah wrote about Gael. In 524, Judges 524, most blessed of women be Jael, the wife of Heber, the Kenite, most blessed of tent dwelling women. Deborah wrote this song, and Jael is one of her subjects. Thank you. All right, it's me again. Hello and welcome. And that was awesome. Uh, I love the imagery of the tent peg. And I really actually didn't even know about Jael until you brought her up. So this is going to be some fun reading for later. So thank you, Ardeth, very much. Um, so I today am going to talk about a woman who is worth more than jewels. And that might be uh, something kind of strange. Um, Proverbs and 3110, the uh, verses I read earlier today, describes a worthy woman who is worth more than jewels. And um, I guess the first thing I wanted to say is when I think of jewels, I think of things that we ad adorn ourselves with, right? I, I wore my rings as a uh, demonstration. I wore these little earrings today. These are these are my jewels. And um, they can be pendants, necklaces, and kind of anything you wear. Um, ladies, they help us elevate our look, make us match. Um, Ardith, you're pro at it. Uh, 
but jewels are also um, or, or a sig signal of wealth and importance, and um, not everybody had them way back when. The other thing about jewels is that they're very tangible. They're things you just have, right? They're things you can show. And um, today, what I hope you get out of what I'm going to share about Ruth is um, that she's worth more than jewels. And that that's saying something. She's worth more than money. So what is this that makes Ruth so valuable um, to the point where we're basically saying that the way we measure value, she's more valuable than that? So what I'm going to share with y'all is from, uh, is basically the book of Ruth. And Ruth is very short. It's uh, roughly four chapters. And um, kind of quick summary. Most people know the story, but maybe for those out there who don't, uh, Ruth was a, a Moabite woman. Her mother-in-law, Naomi, moved with her husband uh, from Judah, from Bethlehem, out to where the Moabites live, and uh, their two sons took wives, Opa and Ruth. And uh, sadly, uh, Naomi's husband passed away, and then uh, shortly after, no, I'm, excuse me, um, Naomi's husband passed away, the, the sons took wives, um, and then they passed away as well. So this is now just Opa, Naomi, and Ruth. And Naomi says to them, I don't have anything for you. Go back to your families. Go back to your gods. Your Moabite women. And I'm going back to Judah. Both of them say, no. No. No, we're staying with you, Naomi. Until Naomi begins to insist. No, go back. Go make something of yourselves. Go get some husbands. Go get the protections that your family will provide to you. And um, Opa says, okay, bye. That's not wrong. Ruth stays. And this is maybe the central part of this whole entire book is this loyalty. Uh, not only does Ruth stay, she insists that she st stays. And she insists so hard that um, she basically says, where you die, Naomi, I will die. Who's your God is my God. And the Moabites didn't serve the God of Israel. Um, so this is saying something. Uh, Ruth dedicates herself to Naomi and to the God of Israel. Uh, so speeding things up, they move back to Judah. And uh, they don't have anything, right? People in the, the city are whispering, hey, that's Naomi, isn't it? And she's like, ah, don't call me that. Call me Mara. I'm so sad. Everything's awful. I can't believe this. Like, I'm here with my daughter-in-law. And so they begin to start a life there. And uh, what does Ruth do? She goes out to the fields per Naomi's uh, suggestion, and she begins to glean, which was part of the law when you uh, collected uh, when the men came out and collected, uh, those who were um, maybe in poverty or widowed could collect behind. And um, catches the eye of Boaz, uh, who begins to talk to her. And uh, he's basically really nice to her. And one of these reasons is because your reputation precedes you. We know what you did for Naomi. We know you're a good woman. And I'm going to show you kindness that I don't even have to show you. Just because you're so you're so awesome. And I know these are supposed to be short. I can go on about Ruth for forever because I, I just think she's absolutely amazing. Um, but there's two characteristics here that I, I really want to call out, which is one is Ruth's loyalty. She dedicated herself and she put her foot down and said, no, this is what I'm doing. I'm going to be here. I'm going to die with you. I'm going to follow you. She didn't boast about this. She did the things that she said she was going to do, and her reputation preceded her. I also kind of want to give this imagery of what this might be like if Ruth hadn't been there for Naomi, asking an elderly woman to go out and glean. That has to be hard. She's doing Naomi a really big solid, and there's a couple things here that I, I want to end with. Um, so for those who know the story, uh, we you, you find out that Boaz is actually a relative of Naomi, and um, he ends up taking her as a wife, even though there's nothing to gain from this. Zero, zero things to gain. And, and why might that be? 
Well, it's because she's she's worth more than jewels. She's more than the, whatever property would be would come with her. Um, this is even acknowledged by the relative who would have preceded Boaz in marrying her. There, there's really nothing to gain here. There's actually something to lose, but it's her loyalty and her commitment to Naomi and the reputation that precedes her and the kindness that she's showing that really show that she's worth more than jewels. The, these are these actions and this character, these things that you can't trade that aren't something you can count. And um, yes, jewelry is nice. I wore rings today to represent people of my family. This one came from my mom. This one came from my dad's mom. And this one came from my mom's mom. And this one came from me because sometimes you just got to buy yourself nice things. And, um, but at the end of the day, um, the things we put on ourselves, the things we adorn, um, the things that are of value, they, they really don't say anything when you have a reputation. And um, where I want to end with this today is Ruth's more valuable than jewels because her reputation precedes her, because her kindness, loyalty, and love, which is actually called out in a verse here um, in four, Ruth 4, um, 15, um, and this is uh, someone speaking to Naomi, uh, when Ruth has her son, who, by the way, is related to Jesus, um, for those who didn't know. Uh, in Ruth 4.15, may he also be a restorer of life and sustainer in your old age. This is talking about um, the son. For your daughter-in-law who loves you is better than seven sons has given birth to him. Better than seven sons, a number of completeness. This daughter-in-law who loves you. What's worth more than jewels? It's love. Thank you. And I invite Priscilla up. Hello, everybody. Is this a good height? Okay. So I am going to be talking to you about Mary. And you may be wondering which Mary, because there's a lot of Marys in the Bible. So you may know the Mary that I'm going to be talking about as the Virgin Mary, Mary, the mother of Jesus. She's also been called the Virgin of Guadalupe, Mary, the mother of God, or Mary, the queen of heaven. There are even people who have made a prayer about or to Mary called the Hail Mary. And some of it is taken from excerpts of the Bible. Um, the first part of it is in Luke 128. It says, blessed art thou among women. And then in Luke 142, it's, uh, it talks about Elizabeth and she's filled with the Holy Spirit. And she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit, the fruit of thy womb. So Mary, in response to this, did not say, oh, of course, or yeah, sure, build me a temple, or yeah, that's right. And she, she didn't even say thank you. So instead, if we'll go to Luke 146 in your Bible, we'll see what her response really was. So that's Luke 146. 146. Give everybody a bit of time to get there. All right. So in Luke 146, her first response was to give praise not to herself, but to the Lord. And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. She went on to speak in humility not referring to herself as a queen, but instead refers to herself as a handmaiden. So if you look that up in Strong's Concordance, that's the feminine version of a female slave. So she refers to herself as a slave and she's surprised and grateful to be chosen for this blessing. So in verse 48, we're going to continue and it says, for he hath regarded the lowest state of his handmaiden for behold, from henceforth, all generations shall call me blessed. Then she proceeds to give all praise and glory to the Most High. So perhaps instead of saying the Hail Mary and praying to Mary, we should try to pray by Mary's example 
and saying the prayer that follows. So the prayer that follows starts in verse 49. And it's and she says, For he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name, and his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. He hath shown strength with his arm, he hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. He hath filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he hath sent away empty. He hath opened his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, as he spake to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. As you read on in the New Testament, all the descriptions of Mary show that she was a very righteous and a very obedient woman. So, for example, unlike Zechariah, when she was told of what her mission was on this earth, that she was going to be a virgin and have a baby, she believed that the absolutely impossible was possible. She obeyed having the faith in God's ability to do the miraculous. And instead of boasting, I mean, if you're a mother and you're carrying the Messiah, some ladies might be like, hey, I'm carrying the Messiah. Can you guys go pick up that for me or whatever? You know, she didn't do that. Instead of boasting, she kept this huge blessing to herself. And then she did everything a mother was supposed to do in order to keep Jesus pure and innocent, following the law in the matters of purification, circumcision, presentation, sacrifices, and participating in Passover. She loved and cared for him as evidenced by um, the story when he was lost in the temple and she was scared. So obviously she loved him very much. And she actually was the one who gave Jesus the cue that it was time to start his ministry. And she instructed the servants not to do what she said, but to do what Jesus said. So she bowed down to his authority and he honored her request. And sometimes when I see that story, I wonder if she knew that asking him to this one request was going to result in the death, in his death in three years. And I don't know the answer to that. But even when everybody was lying about Jesus, beating him and killing her son, she remained just as obedient and silent as the day she found out she was pregnant. She stood by him through the very end, through all of the best things you can imagine as a mother and all the worst possible situations you could imagine. So I ask, if Mary who is arguably one of the most righteous and obedient women that ever lived, just appeared to us right now, and we started bowing and praying to her, do you think she would accept that reverence? Or would she say instead, in all humility, as Jesus and the angels have in different parts of the Bible say, get up, I'm just like you. And instead, let's praise the Lord together because we should praise he who is mighty who has done great things and whose mercy is on them that fear them from generation to generation. There's, if you remember in the beginning, I said that some people will refer to Mary as the queen of heaven. And it bothers me when I hear that. Because when you look at Jeremiah seven eighteen or Jeremiah 44, the queen of heaven is a reference to a false deity in the Old Testament. And that person, well, that deity um, was a source of rebellion for the people of Israel. The women, they would make cakes, they would offer their cakes to her. And when the men were telling her or the prophets were telling them, you shouldn't be doing that, don't be worshiping the queen of heaven, they would say, we're going to do whatever we want because we've got prosperity from it and we're going to do our will and we're going to do as we say. So it's a very rebellious deity. And it's, um, in my mind, it's an insult to somebody who was as obedient and righteous as Mary to call her the queen of heaven. So instead of insulting Mary, in my opinion, by referring her to her as the queen of heaven, a false deity whose worship brought out the wrath of God, perhaps call her the handmaiden of the most high, which is how she referred to herself. It makes me think of this, um, there's a song that says, I'm a prisoner 
of your arms. It's a Spanish song. And it says, I'm a prisoner to your arms. And it's just a beautiful imagery, like Paul's imagery of how he's he calls himself a prisoner to God. And I think of Mary being the most comfortable when she's in his arms, being a prisoner to God in his arms and his servant and doing as he wants. So rather than venerate her above all others in the Bible, I would like to focus my efforts on emulating her. I want to reflect and imitate her devotion and her righteousness and her obedience to he whom she loved the most, her great father in heaven. Really quickly before we close in prayer, I'm so proud of you guys, Priscilla and Ardith and Linda too, for even being a guide as we prepared for this service. Um, thank you everyone for being here today. Thank you mom and dad for trekking down, Victoria for being here, Jay, Grace, Ronan, and Aurora. I know you probably didn't have a choice, but I'm still really happy to see you here today. And um, of course, James here, manning the, uh, manning the, uh, audio system. Uh, before we listen to Mary Did You Know as our benediction song, um, I'm going to do a closing prayer and hope to see everybody at lunch. Father in heaven, thank you for the wonderful women today who um, who came and uh, shared with us. Thank you for those who supported us along the way, and thank you for our church family and congregation. Uh, this It's just a wonderful, wonderful gift you've given to us, your word, and thank you for all the ladies out there who are watching us today. Um, we're thinking about you, even though we don't know you, or maybe we do know you. And um, I really just hope you all have a great Mother's Day. And uh, just remember who you are and who God wants you to be. And I pray in your son's name. Amen. <laughs>